Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Lance. Lance has a protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal injury. He's about 19 months off medication and still recovering, and he's kindly agreed to share his story. Um, so Lance, let's just dive right in. Could you tell us, how did you start taking benzodiazepines? All right, so let's see, it's September of 2021. Um, my mom was dying of stage four terminal cancer. Um, and I've got four teenagers and they all decided that they wanted to live with me full time at that right around the same time and I've got a fairly stressful job too so I kinda ran into a situation where I just didn't have enough time in my day to get everything I needed to get done done um, helping my parents dealing with all the activities that children have plus you know my job um, so I figured I needed somebody to talk to about it. Maybe I was kind of stressed out a little bit. So I made an appointment with a psychiatrist. Now I'd never been a part of the, the mental psychiatric world before. And to me, a psychiatrist was what you saw on TV. You know, you went and laid down on a couch and talked about your problems. But mm -hmm. I walked in and she saw me for about 20 minutes and said, well, you need about a milligram and a half a day of Xanax, and here's some Effexor as well. And that'll fix you right as rain. Mm. And so I never took the Effexor. I mean, I think I took it maybe once or twice, but the Xanax I took, um, I didn't really know much about benzos at that time. Actually, I didn't know nothing at all about benzos other than kind of what you see on TV, you know, where someone will say, well, take a Xanax and chill out. You know, kind of mm -hmm. to make it sound like it's not a big deal. Uh, but it worked, you know, like all of a sudden stress just melted away. So mm -hmm. at first I kind of started taking it just intermittently. But about three weeks in, I started having panic attacks just out of the blue. And I'd never had a panic attack before in my life. And I called her and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And she's like, well, you're having a panic attack. You need to take your Xanax. Okay, so took my Xanax, made the panic attack go away. Looking back now, I think that was interdose withdrawal that I was experiencing, mm -hmm. not panic attacks. Um, so I continued on that route, and about seven or eight weeks of taking it, I was late for work one morning, and I just left the house in a hurry to get to work, and I left the Xanax at home, and right around noon... I just, I, my heart started beating real fast. I started sweating profusely. I mean, like I was having a huge panic attack, only it was, at that time I realized that maybe this isn't panic, this is, maybe I'm addicted or dependent, now I know the mm -hmm. term dependent, on this drug. So I had to run home real quick and take one to calm down and I called her up and asked her, told her what was going on and I told her I think I'm, I've gotten addicted to this pill and I need to get off of it. And her response was, well, you're on a baby dose, um, and you haven't been taking it long, just quit. I mean, she said, you won't feel well for a couple of weeks, but you, you'll be fine, that essentially is what she you're said. You're on a milligram and a half of Xanax, right? Yeah, yeah. And, I was, yeah. and I'd kind of done some research before I'd even called her, and, and if you Google Xanax withdrawal, like the first five pages of Google is just a bunch of rehab facilities. Mm -hmm. And they essentially said the same thing. Well, the first five days are going to be horrible, and then you'll just steadily get better, and by a month, you'll be right as rain back to normal. And so that's what I went with, only that's not how it worked out for me at all. And, and so were you taking uh, half a milligram three times a day? Was that your dosing for this? That's animals? how it was supposed to be dosed, and that's... Yeah. But normally I would try and break the pill in half. Okay. And not take, you know, not take a whole pill. But sometimes okay. I did. I, I yeah. can't really remember exactly how I was doing. I know it wasn't a strict regimen at three times a day, though. Yeah. And so what happened, uh, I guess, after you, your doctor told you, you know, pretty much cold turkey yourself, you'll be <laughs> uncomfortable for a little bit, and then you'll be okay. What, what were the next couple months like? Oh, my gosh. So the first three weeks was a nightmare. Sweating, shaking. Um, if you could picture what you'd imagine someone coming off of alcohol or opiates 
what the the Hollywood portrayal is of that that's that was me that was me just barely making it through minute to minute to minute to minute but I kept telling myself you know this is gonna pass and once this is gone you're gonna be better and after about three weeks it wasn't better and I called her and she basically told me well it's Xanax it's out of your system now you must have some underlying issues coming out and mm. I never had any underlying existing uh, conditions. And you're just like, before. it and certainly didn't feel like this, I bet. It was the, no, uh, no, yeah. it did not at all. Um, and I wasn't sleeping at all, at all. Like, I was going, well, the first two weeks, I think I might have slept maybe seven hours a week total. And it didn't get much better after that for a long, long time. Um, and so what were, your, what were your symptoms, like, three weeks out, like, what, what was the constellation of things that you were going through, which was... Man, I know I'm going to leave some stuff out, because um, there were so many of them, but the biggest ones were derealization, depersonalization, like I've never felt before in my life. I felt like I was in a movie, or, or I, I can't even describe the feeling. It just felt like nothing was real. I wasn't real. felt like I wasn't a part of my own body. Um that I was in control, but I was controlling it f from a distance. Um, insomnia, the worst insomnia ever, which I still have today. Uh, electric shocks throughout my body. Like I would just jerk randomly all day long and 24 hours a day it felt like I just had current running through my body. Akathisia had that for 14 months I couldn't stop walking that was that had to probably be the worst symptom I had mm -hmm. next to the insomnia but for 16 to 18 hours a day if not more Jesus I just okay. had to pace like my neighbors probably thought I was crazy because I was probably walking 30 35 miles a day just who was constantly looking after walking you around the neighborhood when you were going through this I'm sorry who was looking after you who was caring for you while nobody you it's yeah, just me and my kids. And so you, I imagine you weren't working at this time, right? You had to take No, food. I was not. Um, I had to take a six months off for disability. Which, and so I had to keep going to see that psychiatrist, even though by this point I didn't trust her no more because she was the one signing my papers to keep me out of work. There was absolutely no way I could work. Mm -hmm. And she just kept prescribing me stuff that I would try and it wouldn't work and and then I'd try something else and it wouldn't work and it just kept on and on and on. Um, okay. So sorry, I go on with your list. So you're saying the akathisia was the worst symptom, pacing 16 to 18 hours yeah. a day. Yep. So I had yeah. the akathisia. That, that has only recently just gone away like four or five months ago. Um, insomnia. I still have that to this day. That's, that's now my very worst symptom. Um, Hypnic jerks, um, myoclonic jerks, um, blurry vision, just, which I still have. My people, eyes, my eyes won't focus anymore. Just for people who don't know what that is, hypnic jerks. Do you mean, you know, when you're about to fall asleep or when you're sleeping, yes. that you that you just kind of start jerking like that, or your legs yes. will, sh will shake, and then so, the myoclonic jerks is just like kind of these like. Twitches that you have right. large Only they, they were more than twitches. It would be like yeah. my entire leg would just kick. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, two separate symptoms, but kind of the same thing. Um, so I, I would go sometimes. My normal was for sleep was I'd probably go two or three days without sleeping at all, and then on the fourth day I'd maybe catch three or four hours of sleep. Um, but thing is, is I would be so exhausted that as I was starting to nod off, I would just start getting these jerks every time I'd nod off. It, and it was just random. Sometimes it would be my entire body. Sometimes it was a leg. Sometimes it was my jaw. Um, and they weren't like in the limb. It was like a shock to my brain that caused it. Mm -hmm. Like I could feel it in my brain. It wasn't like my limb just jerked. It was like my brain jerked and that caused my limb to jerk. I, <laughs> I'm going to come sure? across sounding crazy. I'm going to tell you things no, that I haven't even told anybody in my family. So I, I mean, what hope nobody at work sees this. 
No, no. I mean, what you're saying is really typical of of the the syndrome that a lot of people have when they have these complicated neurological symptoms coming off benzos. You know, the akathisia, the insomnia, the jerking, it's all mm-hmm. completely in line with what I've seen. Um, and, and then I had look, nonstop look. panic for yeah. months and months and months. I mean, panic attacks that would last five, six hours. They'd, nothing would make them go away. Yeah. And um, another feature that I've seen is these kind of like looping catastrophic thoughts where people are like, I'm dying. My body's, my, I'm, you know, I'm literally dying. Sometimes when it's really severe, people can become paranoid as well. You know, essentially your your mind um, isn't really yours anymore. It's it's like kind of like taken over. I was wondering if you could speak to the psychological uh, effect of being in that state of sleep deprivation where you're like getting kind of zapped. So, you know, what's that yeah. like? So this yeah. is going to be where it gets to really sounding crazy because the mental yeah. symptoms are horrendous, still are to this day. Mm-hmm. Um There was five times during the first 10 months that I went four solid nights and five days without sleeping. And I started hallucinating. And those five times, each of those times I went to the emergency room to try and get some kind of help. I mean, at at that point I was begging for anything except another benzo. I refused to take another benzo. Um, Mm -hmm. And... That was that was rather traumatizing. I mean, I've I've never unintentionally hallucinated in my life, mm-hmm. and the one time I did hallucinate intentionally, I didn't like it at all. It was the only mm-hmm. time I ever did a psychedelic, and I I didn't enjoy it at all. So this was even worse. I mean, I I remember I was in the emergency room, and the doctor there, I told him I was like, I'm hallucinating. He he goes, Well, do you know you're hallucinating? I said, Yeah. I mean, I know what's real and what's not real. But that doesn't mean that I'm sitting in an emergency room right now and there's a spider hanging from a web sitting right on your shoulder. I see it. He's there. There's ants crawling on the floor. I know they're not there because it's an emergency room, but it doesn't mean I don't see them. So I can sit here and act like I'm normal. I'm just trying to explain to you, I'm talking to the doctor, what I'm seeing at the risk of sounding crazy and and being institutionalized. And when I told him that I hadn't slept for, you know, four nights and five days, he said that, you know, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. Your body will force yourself to go to sleep. And I I remember looking at him and saying, well, tell my body that because I have not slept. Yeah. He said, no, you had to have slept. You just don't know. I said, you can't sleep while you're walking. I've been walking for 18 to 20 hours a day, every day. And so would they just send you home or did you did they send you to the psych unit? Like what, what happened? No, they never sent me to a psych unit. They would just send me home. Um, one night, one time I went, it was a pretty slow night and the doctor kind of took pity on me and he had the nurse run an IV and he injected me with um, IV Benadryl and another drug called Reglan. And that knocked me out for about four hours, which I was grateful for at the time. Um, I had another emergency room doctor look at me and say, you realize you're in the emergency room, right? And I was like, yeah, I know where I'm at. He's like, well, what do you want me to do for you, sir? You want some Ambien? And I said, no, I don't want some Ambien. He's like, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, I want you to put me in the ICU and give me some of that Michael Jackson juice. I need yeah. to sleep. Yeah. And he just sent me home, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, another thing, and... and, and you know, when, when people are in these states of severe chemical depression and agitation, like very frequently they'll report, you know, suicidal thoughts, things like that. I mean, was that a feature of what you were going through, having to fight back suicidal so, thoughts? So, it, it? so at 10 months off, I did try to co- kill myself. I couldn't take mm-hmm. it anymore. Um, I did end up getting put in the hospital for a weekend. Um, mm-hmm. They did not have any room in the psych ward, so they just put me in the ICU. Mm-hmm. Um, at 12 months off I was getting that way again and this was the only other time I've taken a benzo since then so I found a nice plush rehab facility that had 24 hour medical staff and I called them up and I set a, set a time for me to show up and I had a couple of Ativans so I took some Ativan just so I'd fail the drug test so they would admit me but I mean I still have to be honest with you, I still have suicidal thoughts to this day. 
<laughs> yeah. Even though and I'm much better than I was even last year, okay. I still have a chemical soup, toxic chemical soup in my head. So when did, so t t talk to us about the, um, the evolution of the symptoms over time, you know, like the different stages of it, because you're still clearly suffering a great deal, but it's the, the, the nature of it has changed. Can you kind of walk through how, how the symptoms evolved and maybe lessened and some of them at least lessened, you know, yeah. from, from, I guess, around the end of 2021 to, to now? So for the first 14 months, I had no lessening of symptoms. Um, other than the original, like acute, acute withdrawal, the first month, month and a half. After that, the symptoms didn't lessen at all. Um, it was insomnia, akathisia, jerks. Um, hold on. I'm having a brain, brain, some brain fog here. Let me think. Um, the jerks, the electric current running through my body, that was that was actually pretty painful. Um, I had patches of skin that went numb, like my whole right arm would just go numb on me, and it would stay numb for hours for no reason at all. Um, blurry vision, which I still have to this day. My eyes won't focus depression like you wouldn't believe I mean like the deepest depression that that I've ever felt in my life and I can't really say how they all went away because I like I just remember one day realizing that I don't have the akathisia anymore I'm not pacing so I don't know exactly when it went away or how it went away I don't remember if it just lessened or if it just went away and I think my brain is blocking that out it was so traumatic that it, it just won't even let me remember. I mean, mm -hmm. It won't even remember. let me remember how it felt. Like, I know it was horrible, but I can't remember exactly how it felt to have it. Um, the insomnia has gotten a little bit better. That right now is probably still my worst symptom. 19 months out is, is the insomnia. I still get jerks when I'm nodding off, but they're not near as intense as they used to be. And sometimes I don't even get them. Um, more now, most of the physical stuff is left. It's mostly just mental stuff that I'm left with now. Um, What's the nature of the depression that that's kind of residual, this kind of chemical depression? Like, what what's that state of being like? Man, it's it's the deepest depression that I've ever felt in my life, and I've been depressed before but nothing like this. This is, it's an unnatural depression. I, it would be almost impossible for me to describe it, how, how deep it is, because I can't even describe it to myself. It's just, it, it's yeah. black, it's dark. And some of it, I think, is from the benzos, and some of it, I think, is just depression from the situation that I'm in. Okay. It's like mixed together. And what is the situation that, that you're in? Is Are you still kind of caring for your four boys? You go on to work, having to kind of juggle all of these responsibilities? Or Yeah, so my mom passed, which yeah. that was that was pretty horrible. I couldn't even go to her funeral. That was, I was right in the middle of this, and I couldn't yeah. even go to my mother's, own, my mother's funeral. Um, I do have to go to work every day because I got to keep providing. Um, I still have my four kids that I have to take care of, and... Yeah. I have very little help. My family at this point thinks I'm crazy and they're pretty upset with me for not showing up for my mom's funeral, but you know, they, they just don't understand the position I was in. I was at eight months off when she died and I was in no shape to do anything. I wasn't even hardly getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, you know, it's just me and my kids and I'm still trying to juggle all of that. And somehow I'm doing it. I don't know how, but somehow I am. <laughs> I don't know how you're doing it either. I mean, it's... Well, and Okay, so, I mean, after you had, the, I guess, the one suicide attempt at around 10 months off, what, what's kept you going? Because I know you said that you still occasionally have, like, the thoughts. What's the thing that makes you just go, 
you know, keep going day after day, even though that the thought the thoughts still pop up. Stubbornness in my children. Okay. I have this. I don't know if I should say this, but I have this fantasy in my head of of recovering. At least I don't think I'm gonna ever be a hundred percent, but I'm hoping that I can get to a point that at least I can live life again. But this fantasy I have in my head is is making an appointment to see psychiatrist and walking in with the Ashton manual and telling her before you start prescribing stuff maybe you should know exactly what it is that you are prescribing and maybe how to get people off of this in a safer manner because I can still remember the conversation in my head when she said I was just on a baby dose she had people that were on six and eight milligrams a day and I was on a small dose, so I shouldn't be having these kind of problems. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's a small dose, um, you know, a milligram and a half. It's, it's still... It's a, it's, it's a small it's, pill. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, when you look at it, you yeah. you look at it and think, well, that, that's not very much. Yeah. But it sure caused a lot of damage. Do you think anything helps with recovery from protracted withdrawal injury, or is it just time... You know, just Nothing hanging in that, there until you heal. I haven't found anything that helps, and I've tried everything. Um, okay. Nothing, nothing works for me at all. It's just been time. Yeah. It's all that's been helping. I mean, like I, I've, I've taken every supplement that anybody. I probably got two thousand dollars worth of supplements sitting in my cabinet because I've tried every supplement you can try. Um, I, I exercise every day, not not as intensely as I used to, but I mean, I still walk 12 miles a day, six in the morning and six in the afternoon, hoping because I, mm-hmm. while I was going through this, I was able to to muster enough brain energy energy to read a book that I got from Amazon called Spark. And in this book, this guy talks about how cardio exercise is like fertilizer for your brain. And so that's really the only thing that, that I've kept on is, is just exercise, just walking. That's all I can really do. Yeah. Um, another thing that I've heard a, a lot with benzo injuries is that the course of recovery is not linear. And by linear, I mean, you know, each day is not better than the day before, but rather it kind of bounces up and down. And sometimes people have a couple of months where they're okay. And then they mm-hmm. go back into a period where they're very, very unwell for maybe one to two months, and then they recover again. I was wondering if, if you experience something similar, or you are experiencing something similar with how you progress in this, that you know things kind of bounce up and down on the way down. So I actually have just started feeling that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, literally just recently where... For, well, 19 months now, in a couple of days I'll be 19 months, so for the for 18 months it was there was no windows and waves type pattern. It was, the first 14 months was absolute misery with nothing getting better, nothing getting worse, but nothing getting better. And then kind of things just started going away, unnoticeable. I didn't notice it at the time that they went away, it was only looking back that I realized it. But that was more of a gradual thing. And now, the past couple weeks, I've been getting some decent windows. Like, Wednesday was a, a really good day. I actually, my brain was functioning almost at full capacity. Um, I wasn't shaking, which I still do a lot. Just My body just shakes for no reason. Um, everything seemed to be working fine. Yesterday was probably one of the worst days I've had in a long time and then today I'm kind of okay again today thank goodness because we had this interview Mm -hmm. so I think I've just entered that phase okay Um, how did your family view this condition you know seeing it from the outside what was it like trying to get them to understand I guess the magnitude of your disability and discomfort and torture of it. What what was, what was it? Yeah, what was that like? So there was there was really no getting them to understand. 
Um, at first they were pretty supportive. Um, I actually have someone that's pretty close to me that was a, a, a very bad alcoholic. And I mean, really, really bad for years and years and years and years. And he finally went to detox and got himself cleaned up. So he was probably the most sympathetic because he'd kind of been through something similar. But he recovered from his alcohol problem in about six to eight months. So after about eight months, they started just thinking that, you know, what's wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? And they just kind of slowly drifted away, which I don't blame them. I mean, there's only so long that you can kind of deal with what I'm going through. They have their own lives to live. So I literally haven't seen anybody in my family since Christmas. That's, that's the last time I've seen anybody in my family. And it's, so it's been about six months. And, what and was that's the mostly because I, I can't socialize at the moment at all. Yeah. And they have lives that they're, they're living. Do you find another thing I notice uh, in this injury is that people's lives become really small. You know, there's like when they're recovering from it, there's only so many things that they can do. You know, they try and keep the things that they're exposed to very minimal because it's like, you know, they can regulate the nervous system within this very narrow range of activities. And if you start adding in stressful people or judgmental family members or people that don't get it, it throws them off and then they feel miserable for like a couple of days afterwards, sometimes longer. And so they end up yeah. having this very tiny life where they only interact with a few people. And a lot of it's by choice because they just want to kind of keep things together. I, I don't know if that, that has kind of, that meshes with um, your experience recovering from this. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty close to it. I, I only interact with people that I absolutely have to at work and with my children. I don't go out of my way to interact with anybody else because I just, most days I, I can't even carry on a conversation. Like right now, it's it's kind of taken everything that I have just to, to follow along with this conversation and to keep my train of thought straight. Yeah, that's and so that's another I, interesting... I have a hard time having a conversation with anybody, especially if the subjects are going to be changing quickly, which most casual conversations do they subjects just change quick and I, I can't keep up with that um, I can't really go into the store because there's just there's too much stimulation I mean sounds sights um, smells it's just too much so other people do my shopping for me mm -hmm. and mostly I just I go to work and then I come home that's that's pretty much the extent of my my social life, my life in general. And may I ask, what, what kind of work are you doing? What industry? I'm in the medical field, actually. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I fix x-ray machines. Okay, yeah. Um, good. And, I mean, another thing that, um, that I think makes it really challenging for people to understand the severity of this is on the outside, you know, talking to you, it's like, Oh, Lance is, you know, Lance is, he's okay. You know, he's making sense in the conversation. And they don't really appreciate that it's taking every single ounce of focus and concentration to even, like, follow what's going on. And so there's this big disconnect be between how you present to the outside world mm -hmm. and the amount of exhausting effort that it's requiring to just, um, you know, just even follow along in, in conversations. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that is that's that's very true um thankfully i before all this happened i had 46 years of being normal to lean back yeah. on so so i know how i'm i need to present myself sometimes i i don't always do it well uh, but it's it's enough that if you don't know me you'd probably think i was normal if you knew me really well then you would know something was wrong yeah i i liken it to this and this is going to sound way out there but i feel like since this has happened to me I've got two separate brains I've got one brain that's like the core me that I've always been and then there's this other brain that was created that's sick and demented and 
he's all that brain is always trying to like get me to kill myself to you know making me dizzy making me not be able to see making me have floaters um, making my brain feel like it's being squeezed in a vice and like I'm sitting here talking to you right now but while I'm talking to you internally I'm having a fight between these mm -hmm. two brains over who's gonna have control so that's it sounds absolutely crazy but that's kinda how it feels to me and that's kinda what makes it hard to follow along because while I'm trying to to listen to what you're saying I've got this fight going on up here as well yeah no that's I hear that a lot in um, a, a lot of drug injuries because I you know I work with people who have injuries from antidepressants as well sometimes and you know people feel like they're still in there like their 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 core consciousness like their thoughts that that observer that is truly them is like in there but then they're in this like chemical state you know which is just um clouding everything and you know right. just and and it's that kind of like you know the thoughts they're not you you know the irritability and the agitation and the discomfort and the depression you know it's chemical and and there's enough to see it because you have that that distance but yeah there's always that kind of fight um yeah and that, that fight's going on 24 hours a day and yeah. as long as my executive functioning is is working like right now i'm in control but mm -hmm. when i do get some sleep at night there's no executive function and the other side takes over and i have horrible nightmares um, like nightmares that i haven't had since i was a child i mean scary nightmares and when i do wake up in the morning it feels like man how to best describe it like there's a toxic chemical soup up here that takes several hours to rectify itself to where I'm presentable to the world again. Like normally yeah. I get out, my, my normal night is I usually fall asleep around midnight and then I'm up at 3, 3.30. And it takes me until 6 or 7 o'clock until I'm, I'm in full control again and able to go out into the world. Okay. Um, I think I'm good with questions, but but Lance, did you have any questions for me? Mm. Well, nothing that I I don't yeah. think that you would probably be able to answer. Like, I mean, I constantly need reassurance that this is going to get better. You know, because that's one of my biggest things is is it feels permanent. I mean, after 19 months, like when I was in that rehab facility. I would watch alcoholics and and opiate addicts come in and sure they had a rough first week or two and then they were fine and there was two other people like me in there coming off of benzos and we were just miserable I mean I couldn't leave my room hardly to even eat nothing and it's just amazing to me that that alcohol and opiates those kind of illegal drugs See, I don't know if it's because there's more research into how to safely get people off of them or if they're just easier on the brain, but it just seems like they're so much less toxic than what I took. I mean, I took a medicine for two months and it's essentially destroyed my life. Yeah. I mean, I've been able to hang on to the material things, but as far as the social things, I have nothing. I mean, I don't enjoy anything anymore. My life revolves around just fighting off these withdrawal symptoms or these bind symptoms i think they're calling them now yeah um well what i will say is that you're that that it is very very likely that you will recover or have a near full recovery just based on what i've seen the um i'd say around 18 months off people are doing uh better and you seem to be following that because and, and by better I, I don't mean that like your life is great now it's clearly not you know it's clearly su substantial suffering but but that the akathisia has stopped and that you're developing windows um yeah and so that so what the trajectory shows me is it's that your brain is is constantly in the process of re-regulating you know it knows something is wrong and it's kind of rebuilding itself to to compensate for the disordered uh, you know the, the dysfunction that's in there and so to me the most promising thing is um trajectory i mean if you had told me you know 
it's been 18 months and I still feel the exact same. That That's a little bit less promising. But, you know, given that things have turned a corner, you know, you're clearly, you're clearly healing in some capacity. And so from about 18 months, I mean, the next milestone, I think, is about three years, you know, and then people tend to do even better then. And, and majority of people, I think, between three and five years are, are nearly 100% better or, right. or they have some residual, but the residual is at the amount where it's not really impacting their life substantially. Their life is meaningful. That's that's kind of the best I could hope for is that (laughs) the residuals don't impact my life anymore, at least not to that degree. I would also like to say that I appreciate what you're doing as well. I mean, it's it's actually nice to have an MD that understands it it, and knows what, understands what's going on and tries to help. I mean... I've seen so many different specialists going through this. I've seen sleep doctors. Actually, the sleep doctor was the only doctor that was ever really honest with me. But I've seen neurologists, sleep doctors, GPs, psychiatrists, um, cardiologists, every every doctor you could specialist you could imagine, and they all tell me there's nothing wrong. It's absolutely nothing wrong. Um, the sleep doctor was the only one that was actually honest with me and. And he said, yeah, you're not sleeping at all. Not really well. Um, I can't even remember what my stats were from that, but it was it was very poor. And he said, he told me, he's like, there's really nothing that we can do for you. He's, I said, he said, I can make you unconscious, but I can't make you sleep. We we do not understand how the brain works. <laughs> that's what he said. At least he, he was honest. I mean, that's... Yeah, he's <laughs> the only one that was honest about this whole thing. But the psychiatrist, by the end of it, she just wrote me off. She was just like, I can't help you anymore. You have OCD, GAD, I I don't know what else she diagnosed me with. But she told me I was concentrating too much on sleep and and I needed to get over it and she couldn't help me no more. And that's that's when our relationship ended. Wow, okay. And the funny thing was is she still thought I was on a Fexer at the time and so I'd asked her, how do I get off this Fexer? And she said, oh, you never get off of a Fexer. She said, depression doesn't go away. It's a lifelong uh, lifelong condition. It's like being diabetic. And you got to take your insulin for the rest of your life. Jesus. This lady is dangerous, Lance. I mean, seriously dangerous. Yeah. I mean, she's not a full-fledged psychiatrist. She's a nurse practitioner. Uh, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty yeah. much where we left it off. And... I remember sitting there thinking when she said that I could never get off effects or even though I wasn't taking it, I just for some reason wanted to see what she would say when I said I wanted to taper off of it. And yeah. when she said I could never get off of it because depression was a lifelong illness. It's, it's just like being a diabetic and diabetics have to take their insulin. You've got to take this effects or when she said that it kind of hit me that at least with effects or probably she knew there was no coming off of that. From everything I've read on Effexor, it's it's one of the hardest to come off of. You know, the thing that kind of, I mean, yeah, Effexor is nasty, but the thing that's interesting was like, I mean, you hadn't been having chronic lifelong depression when you went in there. I mean, your mom was very I wasn't sick. even depressed when I went in. And then, you know, <laughs> like you Like, I had anxious. no depression at all. Yeah, you were like, you, you had a lot of... Um, responsibilities going on and now all of a sudden you've developed a permanent depression and you need to be on effexor for the rest of your life right. i mean it's it's just crazy you know yeah that, that was a that was a, yeah. a beacon of life for me at that moment that at least with with the venlafaxine or effexor she realized that it would be next to impossible to come off of but to tell me that i had a lifelong depression and depression never goes away well that's just not true i mean yeah. maybe there are some people out there that have a, a major depressive disorder that they just can't get rid of but in my case it wasn't true I wasn't even depressed I was just stressed because I was helping my parents you know they they were old and, and my dad couldn't take care of my mom by himself um, then running to sports events getting kids to school making them dinner you know all this stuff there just wasn't enough time in the day and unfortunately yeah. for me looking back I should have thrown that first prescription away but Unfortunately, the first pill I took worked like magic. Like all of a sudden, nothing. Yeah. And I was going to say, 
How do you feel about the medical profession, you know, now that you've had this kind of experience? I don't, I don't trust them, none of them. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, if I didn't know about your YouTube channel, I wouldn't trust you neither. Yeah. That, that's just the truth. The only doctor I think that I would trust at this point it would be like an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. They actually fix stuff. <laughs> yeah. And they fix a part of the body that is not connected to the nervous system. Like yeah. My line of work, I have to diagnose stuff. And if, I came, if, if, if somebody came to me and said, well, the machine is, this part's messing up, this part's messing up, this part's messing up, and this part's messing up, I wouldn't try and diagnose each of those parts individually. I would think, what connects all of those parts together? And that's where I would start. Yeah. And it, it's amazing to me that, that most doctors don't think that way. If I come in and I'm like, my muscles are shaking, um, I can't see very well, my vision's blurry, I've got, I never mentioned it because I've habituated to it, but I've got tinnitus that just screams 24-7. Yeah. It's been there since, since day one of cold turkey. You know, I've got yeah. tinnitus. Um, I can't sleep at all. All of these different issues and not one person ever thought, what connects all of these together? My heart palpitates all the time. That's another one I didn't mention because I've just habituated to it. And there's only one thing that connects all of that together and that's your brain. But yeah. no one ever thinks along those lines and they don't want to think that the drugs could cause this, that legal prescribed medication could cause this. Yeah. That's the worst part. Yeah, okay. Well, Lance, I'm, I'm gonna say thanks Thanks for letting me chat with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording, but before I uh, before I do that, uh -huh. can I follow up with you in 18 months? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd I'd, I'd love to see I'd how actually, you do. I would like that. Yeah, I would yeah. like to see how I'm doing too. Yeah. <laughs> as long uh, not to sound great, as long as that other half of the brain that that Benzo's yeah. created doesn't take over, I'll be here in 18 months. Okay, I think you will. Uh, I'm I'm very confident you will actually. So I think. I know, I know it's misery, but the worst is behind you, and you know it's just going to get better I hope from so. here. I, I yeah. know I've presented myself as looking fairly normal today, but it's it's been yeah. a pretty good straw. I just I didn't want to come on looking like yeah. I normally look like. Yeah. Okay. So. Sure. All right. Well, um, let me stop this. Thanks again.